Hello denizens of the Empire, it's Jabari here. Welcome to the next episode of African Weapons. Today we will be discussing a weapon that you may be surprised to see hail from the African continent. A weapon that relies less on the sharpness of the blade or the strength of the warrior but more on the intelligence and engineering capabilities of those who created and utilized them. Today we will be talking about crossbows. Contrary to popular belief, crossbows were not invented in Europe, nor were they primarily invented to pierce knights' armor. In fact, they were invented in China long before the technology was developed in Europe. The Inuit of the northern regions of Canada and Greenland are also known to have indigenously invented a crossbow. However, as with the usual theme of this channel, we will be discussing an African crossbow created and used by a wide variety of Western and Central Africans including the Bakango, the Bafeng, the Bayaka, the Batmpongwe, Yoruba, Mandinka, Bakwiri, and Benin, among others. The Crossbow a weapon that revolutionized warfare across the globe and what literally led to the demise of the armored knights of medieval Europe, notably in the Battle of Cressy of 1346 and the Hundred Years' War. With its ability to store massive amounts of potential energy without relying on the steady arm strength of the archer, it allowed for high-velocity projectiles to be launched at a foe with much patience, precision, accuracy, and minimal training. As a result, troops could be trained en masse in its use with devastating results. However, outside of Europe and Asia, the crossbow seems to have primarily been used for different purposes that didn't rest exclusively in warfare. The use of the crossbow as a weapon in Africa seems to have been restricted to Western and Central Africa and was primarily used as a hunting or scouting weapon. It came in several varieties, all similar with subtle differences. American explorer Paul Du Chailu largely credited with discovering gorillas and pygmy peoples because, you know, gorillas were obviously invisible until the white men arrived and pygmies never discovered themselves. Uh, apparently. Anyway, he collected a specimen that consisted of a rigid bow that was about 25 inches across the arc with a rectangular cross section. This set through a rectangular hole in the front of a long, slender wooden stalk, which itself is about 51 inches in length with wedged edges. This stalk is split laterally through the majority of its length forming an upper and lower limb, as opposed to having two separate hinged sections. A square shaped peg fixed to the lower limb is pushed through a notch in the upper limb where the bowstring rests. Once the two limbs are completely squeezed together, this square peg forces the bowstring out of its notch, serving as a trigger mechanism for firing the projectile from the weapon. The projectile itself rests in an ever so slight groove. A similar crossbow was collected by English explorer Robert Bruce Napoleon Walker, and it was more or less the same in construction as the other one, only differing in a few subtle ways, including its measurements as well as a series of linear patterns for aesthetic reasons. Additionally, rather than being split, it had a stock consisting of two proper limbs, which were attached by a loop. The projectiles used in these weapons were unique to the African continent and were used to great effect. Before we continue on with that though, I'd like to thank The Coldest Water for sponsoring this video. So it's been a fair amount of time since I've been using The Coldest Water Thermos and I have to say, I don't think I could, sponsorship or not by the way, I don't think I could ever use a different thermos. This is, it, it's just crazy how effective this thing is. It keeps your water so, so cold. I, I literally put some cold water with ice cubes in it before bed, woke up the next morning, guess what, still cold water and ice cubes. It's, it's like a miniature cooler, it's crazy. And I can honestly say, this thing has been helping me drink water more often because I've been pretty bad about it in the past. This thing has definitely helped me do it more regularly. The coldest water thermoses can keep your water icy cold for over 36 hours. This is accomplished through its advanced lid technology, which also includes this tiny little puncture hole which lets in just enough air to build up pressure necessary to drink water through its built-in straw, thereby keeping your water much colder much longer than other thermoses. It's so well insulated that it doesn't even sweat on the outside from condensing water so everything around it stays dry. Also, if you take it in the water with you, it has a rubber grip and a handle so you can hang onto it easier, and it floats so you won't have to worry about it sinking to the bottom of the water. It fits in most cup holders, bike racks, and cars, and it also comes in multiple sizes. You can enter for a chance to win a free gallon thermos at the link down below, or receive a 10% discount on your entire order using my referral link, also down below. 
Paul Duchailu described the projectiles used in these crossbows as either iron-headed arrows or small darts dipped in a red-colored poisonous sap several times until it soaked in deeply and dried into the wood. The plants used to make this concoction were a closely guarded secret. These darts consisted of sharpened splinters of bamboo that were so light that they were known to easily blow away in the wind and thus they had to be held in place by a small arrow groove carved into the stock and a patch of slightly adhesive gum. The effective range of these darts was recorded to be up to 45 feet and they could fly at incredible speeds. Their small size and speed made them the bane of all who encountered them as they were virtually invisible in flight and could kill instantly with even the most pinhole sized puncture to the skin. Sir Richard Burton described what he called the dwarf bolt, or ebe, used by the Mpongwe people, which was always dipped in a poison extracted by boiling the root of a wild shrub. He also mentioned that the Mpongwe were terrible marksmen, seldom landing any of their shots. Perhaps the poison was a compensation for this, to guarantee the kill despite not hitting any vital organs. He too corroborated the potency of the poison used, stating, it is believed that a graze is fatal, and that death is exceedingly painful. Swift deaths and excruciating pain seem to be a common theme among West African aerotoxins from traditional bows, and put fear in the hearts of early Portuguese explorers who attempted to raid coastal peoples. The aforementioned iron-headed arrows were typically about two feet in length with barbed heads like a harpoon, and were used for big game hunting. The Bafeng peoples that Du Chailu observed were described as excellent marksmen, Contrary to the aforementioned Mpongwe observed by Burton, he also remarked that some of their crossbows could be quite strong, requiring considerable strength to lock them into position. In order to set the crossbow up for firing, the archer had to sit down, apply both feet to the center of the bow, and pull the string with both arms with all of his might until it was held in position by the notch. Despite this, some indigenous African peoples of the region viewed the crossbow as an inferior weapon to the longbow. Yoruba, for example, had a proverb expressing their contempt for the weapon, as recorded by Bishop Crowther of the Niger. A crossbow is not enough to go to war with. Whom do you dare to face with a stick? The Yoruba crossbow was just as powerful as the Bafang type, bearing the same trigger mechanism and requiring both feet and both arms to draw it. One of the more dramatic varieties of African crossbows were recorded by Austrian Dr. Felix von Lucien. Compared to the previous examples, the type used by the Bakwiri of what is now the modern day country of Cameroon were relatively small in size. However, it had an enormous barrel about 5 feet in length. Featherless darts were discharged through this barrel, effectively increasing the accuracy of the weapon and making it into a crossbow that functioned more like a blowgun. The stock itself resembled that of a European musket, but lacked a trigger release mechanism, relying solely on the archer to release the string from the notch with his own fingers. As with most 19th century European explorers of Africa, there was an unconcealed disdain for Africans and their cognitive abilities. Most European explorers of the time assumed these crossbows must have been crude imitations of those originally brought over by early Portuguese explorers in the 15th century, as evidenced by the portrayals of European crossbowmen in Benin plaques. Others tended to disassociate the African variety of crossbow from the European version entirely. The crossbow mentioned earlier by Sir Richard Burton called the Nayin by the Mpongwe people of what is now Gabon was described as peculiar to this people and probably a native invention, not borrowed, as might be supposed from Europe. Dr. Bastian theorized that the simple release mechanism of the crossbows made by the Fang people was simply a result of the inability of the native people to imitate those of the European variety. Dr. Felix von Lucien seems to corroborate the thoughts of Bastion by describing the native crossbow's discharge methods as a degenerative derivative from the European form. These largely negative views primarily centered around the African trigger mechanisms that were deemed primitive in comparison to their European counterparts. In reality, crossbows of Europe varied dramatically in quality throughout the continent from region to region and throughout its history and these negative views towards the African variety rested in the fact that they were compared to perfected versions used by wealthy in battle, like the infamous steel crossbow. Contemporary crossbows of Norway used for hunting whales were remarkably similar to their West African counterparts, and are believed to be the possible influencers of the West African variety. While the use of the crossbow as a weapon was restricted to the region spanning from Mandinka lands and Gabon, it was also used for other purposes throughout the continent. 
1861, Scottish explorer James Augustus Grant recorded the use of crossbows used as toys by children at Ukuni, what is now Tanzania, and Emil Tordi described other toy crossbows used among the Mbala children to launch seeds and berries, what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. Similar toy crossbows were also mentioned to be in use among the Bayaka and the Bakongo people in the writings of Harry Johnson. These crossbow toys were very dissimilar to those used in West Africa and were either independently developed or adopted from merchants via the Indian Ocean trade. If this were the case, however, it's highly unlikely that they'd only be used as toys considering the ones brought over to the trade ports most certainly would have been full-fledged weapons. Not to mention, the Congo Kingdom was relatively isolated from the kingdoms of East Africa. To present day, the origins of the West African crossbow remain unclear, largely based on the thoughts and research of 19th century Europeans, which was often unreliable when discussing African people. While some of these explorers opted for an indigenous development of the West African crossbow, the general consensus seems to have been that was borrowed technology either from early Portuguese explorers or from the Dutch or Danes. The latter two living in close proximity to people who were using crossbow technology similar in design and times contemporary with the crossbows of West Africa. Regardless of its origins or its design, the West African crossbow was a truly deadly and specialized African weapon made by African people, and it was adopted, adapted, and evolved to be used to great effect within the African continent. If you enjoyed the video, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. For sources, check out my website, linked below. If you'd like to support future projects, you can do so there as well, or by clicking the join button below, or by becoming a patron. I hope you all enjoyed the video, thanks for watching as usual, and always remember, we don't come from nothing.